Fergus, uh, for your kind words. And it's always a pleasure to fellowship um, with Fergus and Brother David and the whole team again. Um, so it's, it's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I want to read a portion of scripture with you, if you have your Bible. I don't know how you do it these days, whether it's on your phone or what. Is it on your iPad or I just have the, the book. Uh, I like the book. <laughs> um, but it doesn't really matter, I suppose, as long as it's God's word. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6. You don't really need to turn to it, but I want you to turn to it because it's the Lord's Prayer. But what I want to speak to you about this evening and the time um, that I have is the power of forgiveness. The power of forgiveness. Now, you folk probably, a lot of you could speak this back to me because you've heard it a lot here. But I want to particularly focus on the power of forgiveness as a key to healing. And so this is a very famous passage, of course, we know it off by heart, um, the Lord's Prayer, or the Disciples' Prayer, Matthew 6, and we're beginning to read at verse 9. This then is how you should pray, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or from the evil one. And maybe you could just pray right now. Lord Jesus, bring to mind anyone I need to forgive. Will you pray that? Lord Jesus, bring to mind anyone I need to forgive. Now, first of all, what I want to talk to you about is the prison of unforgiveness. I'm sure you're aware that God has established certain laws in the universe, both natural and spiritual. And whilst man-made laws can at times be broken without any consequence, God's laws cannot. And so in the natural realm, um, gravity, for instance, is, is a law that God has created. Uh, so you may want to fly, and sometimes I have the odd dream that I'm flying. It's wonderful, isn't it? But if you jump off the top of a building and flap your arms, you're not going to fly. You're going to die. Um, it's an unchangeable law that actually reflects the unchangeable character of the Creator, the law of gravity, and that's only one. But in the spiritual dimension, there are also laws, or might be better calling them principles. And um, one of them is that bad choices very often bring a curse. And good choices can bring a blessing. That is good choices in line with God's will and God's plan and his Holy Spirit. So when we transgress or we trespass, which literally means step over the line, it affects our relationship with others and it affects our relationship with God. And one of the divine laws of blessing that we find even in the New Testament is that when we forgive others, we will know the blessing of forgiveness ourselves. In Matthew chapter 6 that we read, we have the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And I like that uh, rendering of debt and debtors because it brings to mind the idea that you owe me, that when, when we have been offended, we feel that someone owes us, whether they owe us an apology or we're looking our pound of flesh or whatever it is, they are in debt to us and we are holding them in debt to us. And Jesus is saying, we've got to let the debts go. We've got to clear the debts. But in verse um, uh, 14 and 15, Jesus elaborates a little bit more and of course, the disciples, they wanted their sins forgiven. I mean, who wouldn't want that? But they struggled with the concept of forgiving others, even forgiving 
the other disciples around them. Jesus has to reiterate here in verse 14, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. It's very strong, isn't it? Now, I don't think that this is a conditional salvation. I don't think that's what Jesus is teaching. I think rather he's saying, if you want to know the full blessing of the forgiveness of God in your life, you've got to be prepared to offer that to other people. In Matthew 18, later on, you might want to turn to it. If Jesus is asked by Peter, how often do I need to forgive someone? And Peter thought he was being very generous when he said to the Lord seven times. Um, I think the rabbi said that, the rabbis of the day said, you should forgive someone three times, um, but the fourth time, that's it. Their chances are over. So he was doubling the rabbi's teaching and adding one. And he probably thought that seven being the number of completion, that was the figure that Jesus was looking for. And how did Jesus reply to Peter? He said, no, Peter, 70 times seven, which is 490. And he didn't mean that on 491 that you can have a row with the person. But what he was effectively saying in this exaggerating language, this hyperbole is, Peter, stop counting and just keep on forgiving. And I know that's hard. That can't be done in our natural strength. But this is a spiritual principle. We're not under law. But this is a spiritual principle that if we want to know and live and walk in the continuous blessing of God and enjoy the benefits of his forgiveness, when we ask God to forgive us, if we don't forgive other people, we're asking God for something that we're not prepared to give to others. And do you know what that makes us? Hypocrites. And we get caught in the trap of our own hypocrisy and we actually become imprisoned. And Jesus says that very thing here in Matthew 18 because he then goes in in response to his conversation with Peter. He goes into a parable and he tells the story of a servant who was forgiven a huge debt. Let's say for our purposes, this servant was forgiven millions of pounds of debt by a king. And yet this forgiven servant refused to clear a tiny debt from one of his neighbors. And the king heard wind of this and he threw the servant, the unforgiving servant, into prison until he would repay the entire amount of the debt. And Jesus finishes that parable, his conclusion, if you want to read it, is chapter 18 verse 34 and 35. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Wow. This is what your heavenly father will do. What did the king do? The, the king, the master handed the unforgiving servant over to the jailers. Um, some versions say the tormentors or the torturers until he pays the whole debt. And what Jesus is saying is if there is unforgiveness in our heart, we will never know true freedom. We will be imprisoned in some way, even tortured. you know something? Our reaction to our offenders can do as much harm to us as the original offense. I think about that. The way we respond to hurt can do as much damage, perhaps more, especially if we're imprisoned and tormented. And I have to say to you that some of the most bitter, twisted human beings that I know are Christians who have chips on their shoulder from an offense from many years ago. And I'm not just talking about conscious unforgiveness. By that I mean you know the offense, when it was, how it happened, and the person that did it. 
But many of us are imprisoned by, believe it or not, unconscious offenses. Where we're not even aware of what happened and when it happened. But something happened and there's resentment and bitterness has entered our heart, even at that time. Especially around the years when we're growing up. And we might be reminded of those things now and say, actually, I'm well over that. That was a long time ago. But whatever happened then, because it opened up a particular wound, it can allow the enemy to get a hold on us. And so sometimes those suppressed and buried offenses, we need the Holy Spirit to bring them up to the surface. And really, I think at times we have no idea the depths of the power of unforgiveness in the spiritual realm and the imprisonment that so many of us are in, in mind, body, and spirit. Peter Harbin wrote a wonderful little book called Forgiveness, God's Master Key, and he gives the analogy in this book of how our lives are like buildings with many rooms in them. And each room contains memories of important events in our lives. And some of the rooms in our houses, our buildings, are open all the time. And we can enjoy those memories and we can go in and out of those rooms at leisure. But there are some rooms in our lives. The doors are closed and locked because there's pain associated with the memories in those rooms. Those rooms could be named trauma, rejection, betrayal, abuse, disloyalty, accidents, mistakes. We could go on. But because we don't know how to resolve the painful memories, the door has been shut and it's actually locked. We don't even know how to get into the rooms ourselves. But the problem here is that as our lives go on, And the years pass by, it gets harder and harder to cover up what's in those rooms. And whatever is inside the locked space starts to seep, as it were, beneath the door. And the mess inside begins to visit us through the locked door on the outside and can't cover it up anymore. We can't just put our heads down and press on. The door needs to be opened and we need to go inside and we need to sort out the mess that's in the room. But the problem is the door's locked. Peter Harbin says, Jesus has given us the master key of forgiveness. And he wants us to take forgiveness by his grace and open that door into the room and with his companionship clean up the mess. But the master key is the key of forgiveness. I'm sure you've got your closed doors. We all have. And maybe you don't know how to fix what's behind there. And maybe you are actually aware right now this evening of how the mess has started to seep out and whether it's affecting your mental state, your emotional life, or even your physical health. You're aware that it's touching you. And a lot of people don't realize that a great deal of even physical sickness is coming from this kind of stuff behind the closed doors. Do you know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 10 through to 11 that we must forgive lest Satan should get an advantage over us? It literally means an overreach. that He will overtake us. And he goes on to say we are not ignorant of his devices and his schemes. But we we plainly are ignorant at times of the power of unforgiveness in our lives to imprison us. The second thing I want to share with you is the master key of forgiveness. Yes, there's the prison of unforgiveness. But the master key of forgiveness is wonderful. And I want to break forgiveness into three areas quickly. First of all, Many of us need to forgive ourselves. And I want to emphasize that first of all, because, well, from ministry, I've had experience of praying with people. And I remember one girl in particular, I have permission to share this. She had a whole list of people in her life that she needed to forgive. And believe you me, if you knew her story, that was true. But it was sticking in her throat. And she couldn't even get their names out. And I almost thought there was something supernatural was going on, that she was being choked or something. But 
When she began to speak, I realized, because she said, David, how can I forgive these people if I can't even forgive myself? She was right. We need to be able to receive the forgiveness of God into our hearts, but also release ourselves into the freedom of God's forgiveness. Because it's God's grace that enables us to forgive anyone anyway. We don't do it of ourselves. Now, that seems a strange statement to a lot of people, you know, forgive yourself. How can you forgive yourself? Only God can forgive us. Well, I, I understand that. But it just means letting yourself off the hook. Not holding yourself in guilt and shame because of something that's in your past. And you might say, well, I don't deserve the goodness of God. Well, who of us does? It's just accepting, when we say forgive yourself, it's just accepting what it means for God to forgive us. The truth that he has already forgiven us in Jesus Christ. And some of you, if you're making a list tonight of people you need to forgive, you need to have yourself at the top of the list. Those things you have never got over. Those skeletons in the cupboard. And you know in theoretical terms that God has wiped the slate clean, but you're not living in freedom of that forgiveness. Well, you need to get it tonight. Second person on the list might also surprise you, and it's God. Now you might say, now you're getting ridiculous. You're talking about forgiving yourself, only God can forgive people. And now you're saying, forgive God, sure God can't do anything wrong. I agree with you. I'm not inferring that God does things wrong, but would any of us in the room here tonight say that we never question the workings and ways of God at times? And sometimes when we wonder, what on earth are you doing, Lord, in my life or in the life of someone else, we can allow resentment toward God to embed within our heart, which is effectively a form of unforgiveness and bitterness. And I'm not in any way underestimating some of the experiences that you've gone through in your own life and some of the mystery that there is in what happens to us. We have to embrace mystery, don't we? And yet I am aware that if there is within your heart an issue between you and God, maybe he didn't come through for you when you expected him to, he didn't do something you wanted him to do, or he allowed something that you think shouldn't have happened, and there's a massive question there about the problem of evil and God allowing us free will and other people free will, which means if they've got free will, they can hurt me with their free will. That's a whole other subject, but... If there's anything in our hearts where there's thoughts against God, I would encourage you to bring those to him tonight. And as it were, release God. So yourself needs to be on the list. God perhaps needs to be on the list. And very often, our parents need to be, or our guardians, we need to forgive them. And they're often very high on our list. We're not only the uh, product, as it were, of our ancestors, um, but mostly our parents affect our development more than anyone else. They're the most important people in our lives, certainly as we're growing up. And from the moment of conception, their choices very much affect us. Some of us have had good parents, and we thank God for that. But none of us have had perfect parents. And none of us are perfect parents. And so we've got to face facts that there have been things said to us at times, over us, things done to us. And we can thank God for the good of our parents and honor our parents, as the commandment says, but we're not to be ignorant of some of the bad stuff that has happened. I'm not talking about putting the Belfast Telegraph. But I am talking about bringing it to God and forgiving our parents. Now, let me quickly... In the remaining moments, tell you what forgiveness is and what forgiveness isn't. Forgiveness is not forgetting. You've heard that? Forgive and forget. That's nonsense. If something needs to be forgiven, it's very hard to forget it because it's, it's ingrained deeply on our psyche and our soul. Even God doesn't forget. He chooses to remember our sins no more, which is very different. And so... 
God is not asking us to forget. And if you're wrecking your brain saying, Lord, I'm trying to forget what this person did to me, but every time I see them, I'm reminded of it. That's not what God's asking you to do. He's asking you to forgive, not forget. The memory will change over time. The memory will begin to be healed over time. The sting will come out of it. The emotion will depart, but the memory will be there. It'll just change. So forget about that. The second thing is, forgiving can be living with the consequences of someone's sin. Now, I'm not talking about putting yourself in a vulnerable position, you know. I'm not talking about an abuser being vulnerable, an abused victim being vulnerable to an abuser. We need to put boundaries. And by the way, reconciliation is a few steps along from forgiveness. So you might forgive someone but never ever be reconciled to them because that may be impossible under the circumstances. It's important to distinguish. But why we ought not to put ourselves into vulnerable places, dangerous places? We do need to have to recognize, we do have to take on the chin some things that people do to us. That's life. That's the cross, isn't it? How did Jesus deal with things that were done to him? We read in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Now, as a man, what Jesus was doing there was offloading any potential for, as a human being, any of what was happening, the offenses that were going on to him on the cross, laying hold of him, he was releasing it. And we have scripture for that. We read in 1 Peter 2, verse 23, 24, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. What that's saying is he committed all those offenses up to God, the just judge, who will sort it all out in the end. We have to live with certain offenses. I think that's why Jesus said 70 times 7, Peter. And there's some people in our lives we have to keep on forgiving because they keep on offending. They're the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Paul said, Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. And some of us, you see, are becoming little judges on our thrones, holding people in debt and wanting to mete out the punishment when the Lord says, you need to get out of the way and let me do my job. Amen. And one of the ways we do that is forgiving them. Now, let me say that does not mean they're getting off the hook. A lot of people think, well, this is not right. This is unfair. It's unjust. No, it's just that you're taking them off your hook and you're putting them onto God's. You're letting God be judge. It's just choosing not to hold someone's sin against them. And you might say, well, I don't feel like forgiving them. Well, that's okay. We're not talking about feelings. If you wait till you feel like it, you will never do it. Forgiveness is primarily not a feeling, it's an act of your will. Kari Tem Boon, well known for her family's work in preserving the lives of around 800 Jews um, pursued by the Nazis in World War II. Some of you will know her story, read her book, No Hiding Place. Four of her own family gave their lives for that mission. And her sister Betsy died just before the end of the war in Ravensbrück um, death camp. And Khoi Tem Boon learned in that concentration camp, this is what she said, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. And God will give us the love to be able to forgive our enemies. And there's a wonderful story. After she was released from the concentration camp and the war was over, she, she began on an itinerant preaching ministry talking about her experiences and the love of God and the forgiveness of God. And she was in a meeting in America. And there was a man came up the aisle of the, the gathering right after her talk. And he introduced himself and he had a German accent. And he identified himself as one of the soldiers from the concentration camp. 
And then she recognized him as one of the soldiers who was particularly cruel to her sister Betsy. And in that moment, he reached out his hand and he said, I am so sorry for everything that I did to you and your sister. Will you forgive me? She said in that moment, there was no forgiveness in her heart. In that moment, her heart was empty as she began to recall all that had happened. I mean, we can't imagine, even if you watched the film or read the book, can you imagine what that was like? But in that moment, she said, Lord Jesus, give me your forgiveness for this man. And he did. And she reached out her hand and she forgave him. And it was she who said, Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. I like that. You mightn't feel like it, whatever was done to you years ago. But you can take an act of the will before God, and you can do it. You might say, well, this was... 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago when the person's dead, how to forgive someone that's dead? You can forgive someone that's dead. As an act of your will. Now this sounds like a contradiction and I'm almost finished. But though it's not a feeling, it's an act of your will, you must, by the grace of God, seek to forgive someone from the heart. You say, yeah, that's a real conundrum there. But what I mean is, this is what I'm talking about. Very often, when we start to consider the offenses that have um, been meted out against us, emotion rises within our hearts, and we push the emotion down because we're scared of what will happen, especially men, it has to be said. And when we pu push that emotion from our hearts down, that is how we say to God, no, no. You're not getting at that. So though it's not a feeling and it's an act of your will and you don't have to jump over the moon about the person, you do have to be honest with your emotions if you want to be healed. Because one of the ways the Lord heals is through the key of forgiveness. And it's a key that opens our locked hearts and allows all the toxicity and the poison that's been in there from past experiences to outflow and be released from us. But if you push it down, you're saying, no, Lord, not today. So forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not letting something, someone off the hook. The Lord is the judge. Forgiveness is recognizing that we do have to face injustice in our life and take on the chin some wrong things that are done to us. It's not a feeling, it's an act of our will. And we must, as far as we can, choose to forgive from the heart. Now I'm finished. But just before we go into our healing prayer time, you prayed a prayer at the beginning asking the Lord to reveal to you folk that you need to forgive. Has he? What do you do with that if the Holy Spirit has brought people to mind? There's maybe a locked room associated with memories to do with that person. Well, the Lord Jesus is here tonight. And he wants to take your hand and walk you over to that door that you've been avoiding perhaps all your life. And he is now putting into your hand the key of forgiveness. He wants you to turn the key and go in with him. What does that look like? Well, you could pray a prayer like this. And I'll lead you in in a moment. It doesn't go like this. Lord, please help me to forgive. No, that's not his job. That's your job. It's a choice you make. He's asking you to forgive. The prayer doesn't sound like, Lord, I want to forgive. If you want, then do it. Because it's your will. But it sounds more like this. Lord, I choose to forgive. It's not feeling like forgiving the person. It's saying, Lord, I choose to forgive my mother, my father. And just to help you do it from the heart and get in touch with your heart, 
It would help if you prayed, Lord, I choose to forgive that person for what they did to me and tell the Lord what they did to you. And even go farther and tell the Lord how that made you feel. Rejected. Unclean. Humiliated. Angry. You see what's happening is when when you tell the Lord you're forgiving someone but they did this and it made me feel like that, you're starting to get in touch with the woundedness that's in your soul. And you're giving the Lord permission to come in and to bring the healing. But maybe your prayer goes like this, Lord, I'm sorry for holding myself under guilt and shame when you have forgiven me. And I choose to release myself into the freedom of your forgiveness. If you're on the top of the list, maybe that's your prayer. Or Lord, I have resentment toward you because you didn't do this or I thought you should have done this. But Lord, I understand that your heart, even though I don't, I don't understand the mystery of your hand, I understand that your heart is for me and you love me and so I'm going to release that to you. Those questions, I might never get answers for them, but I'm going to release them to you so that I can enjoy the freedom of your forgiveness. Now let's take a moment of prayer together as a body. And especially if you're going to come later on for healing prayer, I would encourage you to first of all take the steps of forgiveness. And I've seen it before where a person gets a physical or a spiritual deliverance just after forgiving someone. It's very, very significant. There is great power in forgiveness. So let's pray. Let me lead you in that prayer. First of all, it's yourself. Just say, Lord Jesus, just between you and the Lord. You don't have to say it audibly. You can whisper it to him, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry that I've held myself under judgment, guilt, and shame when you have forgiven me. And that assumes that you've confessed your sins. And if you've confessed your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you. And just say, Lord, I release myself into the freedom of your forgiveness. Or if it's been an offense that you attribute coming from God, a resentment, will you say, Lord, I'm sorry that I have been bitter towards you or reserved or aloof because I question what happened in my life, why you allowed something or why you didn't do this thing. You put it in your own words. I ask you to forgive me and I acknowledge that you are good, as we sang tonight, that you are good and your ways are good and you only want good for me. Let me experience the freedom of that goodness as I release my offense, my resentment towards you. I release it now. And then the people on your list, parents, siblings, children, peers, work colleagues, bosses, ministers, priests, school teachers. That's a big one as well. Just say, and get the names together and just say, Lord Jesus, at an act of my will, I forgive A, B, C, D, just take time to do that and whisper out those names to God. Just mouth those names to God. Tell the Lord what they did to you. Just go through them one by one. And tell the Lord what they did to you. And tell him how it made you feel and how you still feel. Take your time.
And even when we go on to the healing prayer part of the service, you can still keep doing that if you need time to do that. That's okay. But then after you do that, just pray this prayer. I now release these people into the freedom of my forgiveness. And I ask you to heal my damaged emotions and set me free. And if you're able to do this part, it's not obligatory, but if you're able, it might be good to say, and Lord, I bless so and so in the name of Jesus. Father, I just pray now knowing that this is a prayer and a transaction that you always love to respond to. I pray that you would meet people in a very powerful and dynamic way tonight, or even just in the gentleness of the whisper of your peace. And I pray that as people have prayed to you now and forgiven others, forgiven themselves and released resentment toward you, to you, I pray that they will know breakthrough in their lives tonight. I pray that they'll know mental and emotional healing. And in that respect, I take authority over those tormentors and torturing spirits of unforgiveness, bitterness, and resentment that have latched on to people because of unforgiveness. And I rebuke you in the name of Christ Jesus the Lord and expel you. I expel you now. I command everything that has grappled to emotions and souls. I drive them away in the name of Jesus of Nazareth that came in the flesh. And in the name and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I come against every physical ailment, disease, stress, an infirmity that has developed from trauma or bitterness. And I command you to be gone in the name of Jesus. And I speak the healing of the Lord Jesus Christ over mind, body, souls, and spirits in this place tonight for the glory of Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Hey guys, if you've enjoyed this video, then please click the thumbs up button to give us a like. This will ensure that we reach more people. And also don't forget to click on the subscribe button to make sure that you don't miss out on any of our new videos. Thank you very much and take care.